The goal of physical therapy is to eliminate impairments and the functional limitations they cause. Sometimes orthotics are needed, either temporarily or permanently, for the goal to be accomplished. This video is a supplement to the textbook and will help explain some of the terms and put motion to some of the components. You should read the chapter and study the pictures in addition to watching this video. An orthosis, spelled S-I-S, is a device used to stabilize or immobilize a body part. Orthoses, spelled S-E-S, is the plural form. An orthotist is a trained professional who makes orthoses. Orthotics is the science of making orthotic devices. The term orthotic is also used as another word to mean orthosis. Orthoses can help people compensate for impairments. Gravity will cause the knee to buckle if the quadriceps is not strong enough to keep the knee extended. An orthosis can substitute for quadriceps action and resist the pull of gravity, thus keeping the knee extended when the person weight bears. If a person is unable to move a joint with muscle power, an orthotic can cause the motion to occur. For example, if a patient can't dorsiflex and the toes drag when the lower extremity swings through when walking, an orthotic can assist the joint motion of dorsiflexion. Sometimes the pull of gravity is too strong for the muscles and ligaments to resist and the bones are pulled or pushed out of their normal alignment. The agonists and antagonists around a joint can also have unbalanced muscle tone so that one muscle is constantly pulling harder. The uneven force will cause the bone to change its normal shape. Orthoses can counteract the deforming force and prevent, or at least slow down, permanent changes in the shape of the bone. Changes in the bones, joints, or soft tissues can sometimes result in the inability to weight bear normally through the lower extremity. Weight bearing may be painful or all of the body weight may be shifted onto structures that are intolerant to pressure and skin ulcers will develop. Orthoses can be designed to transfer weight from painful or pressure intolerant areas to more suitable areas. Joints may also have too much motion as a result of injury or degeneration and orthoses can be designed to restrict joint motion. Orthoses can limit motion completely, allow functional range of motion without excess motion, or allow some motion within a range that is safe for the patient's condition. Any impairment that creates a need to resist gravity, assist joint motion, counteract deforming forces, transfer weight, or restrict joint motion is an indication for an orthosis. As you learn about the types and components of orthoses, think about how they will help patients who have paralysis, deformities, joint pain, or healing injuries. Orthotics are sometimes named for the joints that they are designed to control. The names aren't very imaginative, but it is easier to remember what they are for than the orthotics that are named after the people who invented them. We will talk about each of the basic types. Foot orthoses, also called shoe orthoses, are attached to the outside of the shoe or inserted into the shoe. They resist gravity, assist or restrict joint motion, counteract deforming forces, and transfer weight for the joints and structures in the feet. Let's look at some examples of heel wedges, inserts, and metatarsal bars. A heel wedge raises the heel to a higher level and might be used for someone who has a leg length discrepancy. 
which means one leg shorter than the other. The wedge adds length to the calcaneus on the short side so the pelvis is level when the person stands. If a leg length discrepancy is too large, the entire sole of the shoe might be built up rather than just the heel. A wedge might also be used for someone who has a plantar flexion contracture or permanent change in the bony structure of the joint. The wedge would allow weight bearing on the entire sole of the foot so the person would not have a calcaneus or equinus gait deviation. This picture shows a heel wedge as you are looking down at it from the top. This picture shows the heel wedge from the side. It is hard to see, but the left edge tapers down to a thin edge so that it is more comfortable under the foot. The height can vary depending on the patient's needs. Heel wedges can be inserted into the shoe as this picture shows. An insert is very versatile because it can be moved from shoe to shoe, but it takes up space and can change the fit of the shoe. A maximum of 3 eighths of an inch can usually fit inside of a shoe. Wedges can also be fastened to the outside of a shoe. Not all shoes are suitable for having the wedge outside, and some people may feel like an external wedge is too noticeable. People also lose the flexibility of changing shoes unless they go to the expense of having all of their shoes modified. This picture shows a shoe that has been modified by having extra height added to the entire sole. This sole lift would be used for someone who has a leg length discrepancy of more than one half of an inch or one centimeter. Other orthotic devices that are designed to be inserted into the shoe can control the position of the calcaneus to correct supination or pronation, support the arches, and take pressure off heel spurs. Orthotics like these can be moved from shoe to shoe. These inserts are designed to cup the heel to keep the calcaneus from tipping sideways and causing supination or pronation. This picture shows heel cups inside the shoes. This particular orthosis is made with one side thicker than the other. The thicker portion is placed on the medial side of the heel if the patient's foot rolls in or pronates. The thicker side is placed on the lateral side if the patient supinates. As you can see in the pictures, the subtalar joints have good alignment and the patients are able to bear weight on the calcaneal surface. These inserts are designed to decrease weight bearing over the medial tuberosity of the calcaneus for people who have pain with plantar fasciitis. The outer white borders are made of denser material than the blue centers and take more of the weight. These inserts are used for arch support. If the medial longitudinal arch collapses when the person weight bears, pes planus, an arch support can stop that from happening. Inserts like this can also be used to provide weight bearing over a larger surface area if the person has a high arch or pes cavus. Foot orthoses can also be designed to help with forefoot problems by shifting weight from the heads of the metatarsals to the shafts. Metatarsal pads are inserted in the shoe and metatarsal bars are attached to the sole of the shoe. This picture shows the position of a metatarsal pad. These insoles insert into the shoes and the red pad is the metatarsal pad. This is a picture of a shoe that has been modified with an external metatarsal bar. The modified shoe is the one on the right. 
This shoe has been modified to have a rocker bottom. As a person walks, the shoe rocks from back to front, taking pressure off of the metatarsal joints. Let's move on from foot orthoses to talk about AFOs. An ankle foot orthosis controls the joints of the foot and the ankle. It has uprights that connect the distal end of the AFO to the proximal end. The uprights can be either metal or plastic. A distal attachment fastens the AFO to the shoe. Metal uprights are fastened at the bottom of the shoe with either a solid stirrup or split stirrup. Plastic uprights are molded to the shape of the patient's leg and are usually continuous with the part that passes under the foot. All of the features of a foot orthosis can be added to an AFO to compensate for leg length discrepancy, pronation and supination, painful metatarsals, etc. In addition, the AFO can completely immobilize the ankle or limit dorsiflexion or plantar flexion or assist dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. This is a traditional AFO. It has a split stirrup, metal uprights, and leather cuffs to hold the uprights in place. It has a dorsiflexion assist and plantar flexion stop. There is no foot control beyond what is provided by the shoe. These AFOs are molded from rigid plastic. The one on the right is an off-the-shelf AFO that is adjusted to fit the patient. The plastic is heated so it can be pushed in a little or flared out a little to fit the patient precisely. Ready-made AFOs may not be adjustable for every patient. The AFO on the left was probably custom made for the patient. You can see that the calf part is very small because the patient probably had a great deal of atrophy. The inside has been built up with foam padding to distribute pressure better. The uprights can be attached to an AFO by using a solid piece of metal that is riveted to the bottom of the shoe. A solid stirrup is more stable, but the person is limited to wearing only one pair of shoes. A split stirrup has uprights that can be removed and replaced into other shoes. This video shows how the stirrup can be attached. This AFO also has dorsiflexion assist. The person would use the plantar flexor muscles to plantar flex the ankle when pushing off, and when the weight came off of the foot as it starts to swing forward, the spring would dorsiflex the foot. You can see the plantar flexion stop in this video. The patient can dorsiflex actively, but the orthosis is made to limit the amount of plantar flexion. This video shows how supination or an ankle varus is controlled. The extra flap of leather is against the patient's ankle, and as it tries to roll out, the leather resists because it is buckled around the upright. If the patient had a valgus, the leather flap would be on the other side of the shoe and buckled around the other upright. This orthosis is called a ground reaction AFO or floor reaction AFO. It is designed to keep the knee from buckling as the person walks. Remember how we blocked the tibia during a pivot transfer to keep the knee from flexing? The anterior band of this rigid orthosis has the same effect. It keeps the tibia from moving forward so the knee can't flex. A patellar tendon bearing AFO is another type of AFO. It transfers the body weight from the bottom of the foot to the patellar tendon, tibial flares, and gastrocnemius muscle belly. It would be used for someone who can't bear weight on the bottom of their foot. This AFO is called a bivalve because it has two parts. It is designed to contact all surfaces of the patient's leg to hold the ankle and foot firmly in place. It has to be opened before it can be put on or taken off. This video shows how the bivalve AFO is taken apart. 
When it is separated, the patient puts the back part on, then the front part, then fastens the Velcro. Orthoses can also be used to help stretch contractures. This orthosis was custom made for a man who had a transtibial amputation and developed a knee flexion contracture. The portion on the right is a thigh cuff and you can see a hinge in the middle that connects the thigh cuff with the leg portion on the left. Notice how the leg portion is shaped like you would expect a residual limb to be shaped. The plastic bar lying below the picture will be attached to the two parts of the orthosis to hold the knee in extension. In this picture you can see the bar in place. As a knee flexion contracture is stretched, the bar will be lengthened to hold the knee in even more extension. This technique is called serial bracing because the patient will have a series of changes in the orthosis to help achieve the desired effect. In this case, more knee extension. Now let's look at KAFOs. A knee ankle foot orthosis can have any of the components of foot orthoses and ankle foot orthoses plus knee control. The orthosis is usually hinged at the knee to allow flexion to occur. The amount of flexion and extension can be controlled by locks and can vary from no motion to full motion depending on the needs of the wearer. The brace can also have genuvarum or genuvalgum control that is constructed the same way as controls for ankle varus and valgus. The thigh band keeps the proximal end of the orthosis in place and it can even be made for weight bearing like the socket of a prosthesis. This is a traditional KAFO that has metal uprights attached to the shoe with a split stirrup. It has leather cuffs around the leg and thigh, dorsiflexion assist, plantar flexion stop, and knee locks. This video shows how the knee joint is unlocked before the person sits down and how it is locked again after the person stands. The person who uses this orthosis is expected to walk with the knee locked in extension. This orthosis has dorsiflexion assist and plantar flexion stop. This is a molded plastic KAFO. The leg portion is like an AFO. Metal uprights have been added to connect the ankle foot portion to the thigh band. Velcro fasteners secure the orthosis at the thigh and just distal to the knee. The knee joint does not lock on this orthosis. There is some friction in the mechanism so that the joint doesn't just drop. The knee is stabilized by the location of the axis of the orthotic knee relative to the wearer's knee joint so that the vertical gravity line is in front of the axis. Body weight falling in front of the axis holds the knee in extension during stance. You can see that the knee does not bend as weight is placed on the heel and the body moves forward over the foot. The knee joint is supposed to be locked when a person walks with this orthosis and you can see what happens to the knee joint as the orthosis is moved forward and when weight bearing is transferred during stance phase. When the orthosis is locked, the knee is stable. A hip knee ankle foot orthosis, or HKAFO, can have some or all of the features of a KAFO. In addition, there is a metal hinge at the hip that prevents hip abduction, adduction, and rotation. The orthotic hip can also have a lock to prevent hip flexion. The pelvic band holds the proximal end of the orthosis in place. It is positioned to lie between the trochanter and iliac crest. Although this orthosis looks lightweight, the person who would need an orthosis like this would not have much independent leg movement and walking would be difficult. 
The person could walk with crutches or a walker by using a twisting motion of the trunk to move the orthosis forward. The trunk, hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis can be constructed to control all of the joints of the lower extremity plus the trunk. A person who requires an orthosis for trunk control would most likely need HKAFOs for both lower extremities and would have locked knees and hips. This sort of orthosis is best for just standing to bear weight on the lower extremities. If the person had sufficient upper body strength, a swing to or swing through gait might be possible, but the motion would have to come from the shoulders, moving the entire body at one time. Or the person could shift the body weight to one foot and swing the arm to rotate the body and other foot forward. Walking would be difficult and exhausting. Trunk orthoses are designed to control motion of the spine and provide compression of the abdomen. This is a simple, off-the-shelf elastic back support. Its main function is to offer abdominal compression. A person who has problems with orthostatic hypotension might wear something like this to help promote venous return. People who have lumbar back pain might also wear a binder to decrease some of the work of the low back muscles and decrease pain. The binder is usually worn under the clothing. Lumbosacral orthoses can also look more like corsets with laces and stays. Stays are rigid strips of plastic or metal sewn into the corset. You can see the stays on the back of her corset running parallel to the spine. This type of corset would provide some control of flexion and extension. If it has stays on the lateral sides, it would also provide some side bending control. This is a cache orthosis. C-A-S-H, cache, stands for cruciform anterior spinal hyperextension. Cruciform is a word that means cross, and this orthosis is used to restrict flexion. This is a molded plastic thoracolumbosacral body jacket. This type of an orthosis is bivalve and would provide almost total motion control of the spine. Cervical orthoses, like trunk orthoses, can vary from soft types that offer support but not true immobilization all the way to complete immobilization. Please check the pictures of the four-post orthosis and halo orthosis in the textbook. Phil is modeling a soft cervical collar. It is a stockinette wrapped foam that is contoured to fit the neck. It fastens with Velcro at the back. It would give the neck some support to allow the muscles to relax, but it would not stop all neck motion. This is a hard collar also called a Philadelphia collar. It is bivalve and it fastens with Velcro on both sides. There are various kinds of specialty knee orthotics that are used after injury or surgery to the knee. This video will show features of two different kinds. This is a simple knee immobilizer that people commonly wear after an injury or knee surgery. You can see how an elevating leg rest on a wheelchair is used for a person who is wearing a knee immobilizer. This kind of a brace is called a Bledsoe Extended. It is used after injury or surgery when the knee needs to be completely immobilized or a limited amount of safe movement is desired. The Bledsoe Extended is an off-the-shelf brace that is adjusted to the patient's size. The screws are loosened and the parts are moved closer together or farther apart to fit the patient. This picture shows the knee joint of the brace. The silver pins can be moved to set the maximum amount of flexion and extension that the patient is allowed to have. They are usually locked with no motion in the beginning and allowed to move a little more each week. The orthopedic surgeon decides how much motion is allowed. This brace is set to allow 45 degrees of flexion, 
and 0 degrees of extension. In this picture you can see the 45 degrees of flexion that is allowed by the brace adjustment. We looked at some of the features of orthoses and this next section of the video will help explain how the components are chosen for a particular patient. An orthosis must be prescribed for a patient and the proper one is chosen very carefully. All of the factors on the screen have to be assessed to determine which orthosis will best compensate for the impairments so the patient will have maximum function. Physical therapists and assistants can gather data to contribute to the prescription process. Goniometry is used to assess active and passive range of motion to determine whether the patient needs an orthosis to hold the joints in proper alignment or an orthosis that is modified to fit fixed bone and joint deformities. Fixed is a term that is used to mean unchangeable. A person who has a knee flexion contracture may need an adjustable orthosis for serial bracing to stretch the contracture. An orthosis for a person with a knee flexion contracture who is able to walk needs a modified lock to allow the knee to lock even though it won't fully extend. A person with a hip flexion contracture has an altered vertical gravity line and could not rely on the type of orthosis that locks because of where the vertical gravity line falls relative to the base of support. These orthoses have been modified to fit fixed orthopedic deformities. They are shaped to the patient's foot and built up in places so that the entire sole has contact with the inside of the brace and the sole of the orthosis is flat on the floor. You can see the built up sole of the AFO in this picture. The white wedge shaped portion has been added to the bottom of the AFO after it was shaped to the person's foot. This picture shows a standard plastic AFO that could hold a flexible foot in correct anatomical position. You can see that this AFO isn't adjusted to fit fixed deformities. The varus or supination correcting leather flap and strap is an example of an orthotic component that would hold a flexible ankle in position. When the person weight bears, the ankle would roll out. The leather pad keeps that from happening. Lower extremity length is measured to determine whether a person has a leg length discrepancy. If one leg is less than a half inch shorter than the other, a heel wedge can be used on the short side. If the difference is more than a half inch, a sole lift should be used. If the person has trouble swinging the impaired leg forward when walking, a half inch lift might be put on the unimpaired side to give more room for clearance. Manual muscle testing will be used to determine whether the patient has sufficient muscle strength to move the extremity and hold body weight. Even if there is weakness, the patient's ability to complete functional tasks without an orthosis also has to be considered. An orthosis will probably stay at home in the closet if the person can accomplish what they want without it. The presence of spasticity also affects orthotic prescription. The orthosis has to be strong enough to control the unwanted muscle action without creating pressure areas. You will usually see more straps and pads for orthoses that control spasticity. Patients who have a loss of sensation need to have smooth edges and very well fitted orthoses. Patients with proprioception impairments can't tell where their feet are and whether or not a joint is extended. They need orthoses that will stabilize the joints. An orthosis conforms to the shape of the extremity and can put pressure over bony prominences. Straps can slow blood circulation if they are too tight or if edema develops as a person is wearing the orthosis. People who are unable to feel pressure from the orthosis are more likely to develop skin breakdown and they need to be educated to look for red spots and edema. No matter how much we think orthoses will help patients, we can't make them wear them if they don't want to. 
if they can function well enough without an orthosis, if they're still in denial about their impairments, if they don't like the look of the orthosis, or if they think using the orthosis is too hard, they won't use the orthosis. If they don't have the cognitive ability to understand why they should wear it, they won't. An orthosis shouldn't be prescribed for a patient if they won't use it. Before the correct orthosis can be prescribed for patients, upper extremity function has to be assessed. Patients need sufficient range of motion and strength to doff and don the orthosis. They also must have sufficient upper extremity function if they need ambulation aids to walk. If they can't hold an ambulation aid or weight bear on their upper extremities, it is pointless to give them an orthosis that is designed for walking if they must rely on their upper extremities for assistance. The physical therapy care plan will address all of the points on the slide. Be sure to read the textbook for explanations of the first three items. Skin care involves checking the skin for red spots that don't go away in two hours or edema that develops while wearing the orthosis. People begin wearing an orthosis for short periods of time and gradually increase the time until they can wear it all day. Patients should also be educated to monitor the fit of the orthosis in case body weight increases or decreases or atrophy develops. Orthosis care can be summed up simply. Inspect the orthosis regularly for signs of fraying and cracking and loosening joints. As you are out in the clinic for your rotations, look at the orthoses that people are using and talk with your clinical instructor about how a particular orthosis helps a person compensate for the impairments that limit function.